Warning, this is going to be technical. Hello. Well, today I'm going to be working on a fascinating uh, early DAT machine, and this one is specifically designed so that it can work with PCM 1630 and 1610 uh, PCM encoders which use umatic tape. But it is also a DAT machine in its own right. So uh, I want to have a look at initially see what it does and have a look inside. I can see some screws are missing so I think I should take a poke around inside before I even power it up. Let's get stuck in. So here it is. It's a handsome looking machine but cosmetically not so good. That's been bashed there. There's rust on some of the cabinet work. The screws missing. Uh, ooh, all our switches feel a little bit croaky. That doesn't feel too good. That scraping at one point. So it's been knocked about a bit I think. Uh, Right, so let's take a look inside before we even power anything up. Now the thing I'm most interested in is this. Oh, also we need to connect them up with this multi-way cable and what have you. I don't know what all these cables do yet. So uh, we'll start by having a look inside the DAT machine itself. Uh, you remember I mentioned this has a separate A to D and D to A box. So it's the 2500B. And it has this SPDIF inch im out, ASEBU, and SDIF. What does it say? SDIF2 is a bit faded. And that's the input that I'm interested in. Let's take a look in here first. Right, this has clearly been apart because these screws don't feel right. Not the vintage of the machine. The mishmash of screws. Oh, side screws as well. Yeah, these look like PC screws, these aren't right at all. So there's some PC screws being lashed up in the front. One of the rear screws is missing. Oh dear, this has some history, doesn't it? Why can I never get anything that's just broken down? Okay, right away, uh, I can see there's a drive belt missing. So there should be a drive belt connecting this worm drive to the motor. So it's clearly not going to do anything without that. So we'll uh, put a drive in there, a drive belt in there before we start. Okay, I fitted a belt that really does look to be exactly the right size. So that's good. Let's take a look inside, see if there's anything else I need to take note of. There's a certain amount of dust and contamination in here. Around the back, not quite sure how all these connectors hang together. We have a big multi-way connector that clearly has to hook up. And it's labelled 5 and 5, so obviously they have to go together. This um, connector is looking a bit worse than wear. A pair of audio leads, well... Clearly supposed to be in a set of four, uh, two of these, and there's only two, only a pair, so I'll have to... Uh, Arrange some alternative ones. And there's also this BNC connector. It's all looking very well used. Right, let's uh, get a cable for that. Now the signals I'm most interested in later will be, if I can get it to work, the inputs here, which are SDIF2. But it's got ST, uh, channel 1 and 2, but I don't see word sync in. There's a word sync out. <sighs> don't understand how it does that without word sync. So there's a mystery. I see the DAT machine. They've both got their own power input, so they'll both need to be powered up. Both set to 240 volts. All right, but before we power up either, let's take a look at the uh, insides of the bottom unit, which considering some of the screws are missing, is a little bit worrying. Most of the screws are missing. The construction and a lot of the feel is very similar to 
the uh, PCM 701 ES decoder, which I have one of. Screws are similar, construction similar. I think a lot of the circuitry will be similar. There's a big gap here. It looks like uh, either some optional extra is not in there, or heaven forbid something's missing, or uh, the chassis was used for some different product. I don't think anything's missing. Looking at the connectors, I'm not seeing any cables to nowhere. This is a transistor using this as a heatsink there. No, I don't believe anything was fitted in there on this model. Doesn't look like it. A lot cleaner, actually, despite the rusty lid. This looks reasonably good inside. Well, that doesn't appear to be unduly hacked up, which is a relief. Let's power it all up, then. OK, they're uh, connected up to an isolation supply. Um, and initially have them switched off and just make sure nothing goes bang when I connect power. Okay, pad it down again, switch both of these on and then see if anything lights up. Then immediately goes into error indicator. And that's all. Are there no lights on this at all? Is there a power light there? Oh yeah, there's a power light on that one. A bit dim, if you can see it. Well, the dim green light. It seems very dim. And that just says error indicator. Well, we better see uh, what error is indicating it. We have the service manual, but it's not searchable one. Okay, the uh, error indicator is more about whether there's errors on the tape, so that's not very helpful at the moment in debugging the fault, that it's dead. Well, seemingly dead. Of course, it could be the display's not working, so uh, maybe we should try a little bit more. I do worry about this light being so dim, but... That won't have any bearing on whether this display lights up. Bone out some dust, and I want to try and see if we can meter out some of the connections along here. Uh, see what the voltages are. Looking at this one, I hope you can just about see that. Uh, maybe you can't, but it's connector 971, and it should have pin 1 should be 5 volts. So uh, we'll start by powering up just the DAP machine and see if that's right. And if it isn't, we suspect we're going to be looking at power supply issues. So pin one, power it up now. Nothing. Switch it off. Oh, it wasn't switched on. Try again. Power up now. Five volts. Okay. Pin two should be ground. Pin three is reset. Um, not quite sure what to expect on that one. Pin 4 should be minus 33 volts, so we'll uh, do that one. Minus 33 volts, yes. And then there's AC on these two. Not sure what voltage AC. Doesn't say what voltage AC. That may be for the uh, heat, the, the display. So I'll switch this to AC mode. We don't know what voltage it's supposed to be because the diagram just says AC, which is vague. It doesn't feel like an AC voltage, does it? Not sure what to make of that. Let's look at some more voltages. OK, we should have 5 volts here. This is 981. Should be 
5 volts, ground minus 5 volts. Let's have a look at those voltages. 5 volts, ground minus 5 volts. Yes, you may not be able to see the minus symbol very clearly on my, uh, my, my meter due to reflections. There it was. So I should have reset. I don't know what the reset voltage should be. Yeah, just reading zero. Minus five volts. Yeah. Ground plus five volts. Plus six volts, I think. Yeah. Ground, and then I think 6.6 .6 volts is the last one. The power supply seems to be working, from what I can tell. So the power supply appears to be working, apart from those two contacts which say AC at the end. And looking at the uh, PCB, I don't know if you can see it, but the uh, just in here, these two contacts here, it says on the board AC 2 volts. So that's probably uh, the heater wires on the fluorescent display. So let's check again, see if we can um, measure that voltage. So I've set the meter so it should be able to display 2 volts. And we'll see if we can meter 2 volts AC when I power it up. Actually I'm measuring about 4 volts AC. Okay. So I don't see any problems with the power supply. This is a shame because I think I'd have rather had a power supply fault than any of the alternatives. So we need to find a micro computer board. Well, it seems to be on the front panel. We're going to have to have a look at that. So the micro computer board is apparently behind here. So let's uh, have a look at that. There are wires all over this. This looks horrible. There are bodge wires everywhere. I wonder if they're Sony's bodge wires or somebody else's. The soldering on some of these bodge wires doesn't look manufacturer. There's a collection of, I think, four wires there. I don't know. certainly makes it harder to work on. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know if it's been hacked up by somebody or if it's just a bit of a pre-prototype sort of, you know, not very well designed piece of kit. There's a lot of dust in here. An awful lot of dust. <sighs> Too much dust. And nothing from the CPU board at all. I'm not rating my chances very highly here. I'm just going to see if we've got 5 volts on an IC I can see there, because I don't know, it just seems extremely dead. It's a 74 series IC, so I'll just see if we can meet the supplied voltage. Yeah, 5 volts on that. It all seems to be powering up, but the CPU isn't working, which is like really bad news. Because you don't want a fault on a board that looks like that. So it just looks like the CPU is not running. I could scope 
a um, ceramic resonator, I suppose. Can't quite see the reading on it. Might be some other frequency, but it should be something visible. Yes, there is a signal on the oscillator. So maybe our problem is that the display is not working and we can't go any further because we can't see what we're doing. There's some really terrible bodging going on in here. Wires soldered to resistors and bits of solder left on tracks. Oh, it's just dreadful. Well, having done all the obvious screws on this front panel, it's not coming off. And I'm beginning to think that either this has been hacked up by a fool or it's a pre-production part. It's a prototype. So I'm going to have a look on the back and see if there's a serial number. Serial number 502063. Well, that sounds like a proper serial number. So the 502 could be the model and 63 could be the uh, actual serial number. And what's the serial number on the interface board? Interface unit 501879. So that sounds like a much bigger number. That's much more like it. So 501 and 502 is like the model number. So this is number 63 ever. Whereas the other one is number 1870 something. So it could be a prototype. I'm sure it's worked at some point. But with all those bodges on it, <clears throat> it's going to be essentially impossible to debug. So the chances of it working with this unit dead are close to zero. Of being able to process the signals as I intend. Could well be the display's trying to tell me something, but it's not lit up. It could have an error code on there. But since that light's not coming on either, hmm, I don't know. I suspect the CPU is not working. You know, the one thing I hadn't really covered off properly was that reset signal. And looking at the diagram, it's supposed to be, I believe, at around 4.9 volts in normal operation, as far as I can tell. So let's check that. Because if that was stuck low, then that would potentially stop the whole machine from working. So it should be low, obviously, I think, when you switch the machine on and then come out of reset. So I'm just using a meter rather than an oscilloscope at the moment. Let's switch it on and see what we get. Is that stuck low? That's stuck low, isn't it? I'm on that reset signal. It seems to be a sequence of four inverters in a row. <laughs> um, but it seems that the start of them should be low. So let me see. You go from low to high to low to high to low. Oh, that's not makes sense, does it? Surely four inverters, it should be high. I don't know. But it's possible that reset line's not working. Should I stick a, an oscilloscope on? I don't know. I was, trouble is with startup sequences, it's very hard to see what... Uh, the moment you switch the power on, I suppose I could find a way, but... Um, let me just investigate the circuit a little bit further. There's uh, an IC903, which is 74HCO4P set of inverters. That's on the power supply board somewhere. I think I see it. Let me set you up so you can see that as well. I'll just make sure everything's powered off. So can we see it? There's the IC. Let's start by having a look at the uh, supply to that IC. So I'll uh, look at that pin 14. Power it up. 5 volts. 
Then according to this, pin 1 should be low. Uh, it's sort of hanging around about 2 volts. Slightly strange voltage. Pin 2 I think should be at 4.9 volts. It is. Then pin 4 should be high as well. 8 is the output and should be high apparently. It's not. So I don't know how this circuit's supposed to work, but I think the fact that we've got the wonky voltage on the start. Let's have a look. It's got a capacitor. Switch on now. Goes straight to about 1.7 volts and stays there, 1.8 volts. But I don't know why. I think I have to take the board out. <coughs> that could be hard. That could be really hard. Doesn't look easy to get to. Right, we've got to take this power supply board out. There's two capacitors, two 10 microfarad capacitors. One of them is the timing component for the reset, and one is on a circuit nearby. Uh, they both appear high ESR and no capacitance, according to my capacitance meter, when they're in the circuit. But I can't really test them in circuit. So we need to get this uh, power supply board lifted. I almost wonder if they expected to take the uh, DAT mechanism out before you take the power supply out. Do you know, it's going to do so much damage taking this power supply out, I'm almost inclined to do a, something of a bodge, but it's safer for the machine to maybe snip those capacitors and solder new ones in regardless. It also means I get the benefit of being able to measure their capacitance without desoldering them. Because, of course, desoldering very often reforms them. So let's do that. I'll start with the timing capacitor, which is my most serious concern. I'm going to snip it out. Right, there is the timing capacitor. I mean, it's Elno. It's a top make, but it's old. Let's do a capacitance test on it now. It could be fine. I'm going to have to replace it anyway now. Four microfarads, high ESR. Okay, let's replace that one. Okay, so I've uh, replaced these two capacitors here. I think it's this one that's the uh, reset. It's not the prettiest bit of work having to solder on the top side of the PCB, but as you can see, removing this board is just uh, asking for trouble. So uh, I've decided against that. Let's see where that gets us. I had a slight problem. I lost some footage, but that may not have been altogether bad because a lot of what I did over the next few hours was wandering off in all kinds of directions. So I can demonstrate to you now what I found and some of the progress I've made. So firstly, I fitted those capacitors. Let's see what happens. Result, it powers up. How's that for progress? Something else I did, by the way, was remember I was complaining the LED in here was very dim and I was worried that was a power supply problem. Well actually it just turned out to be a really pathetic LED. So I'm afraid I've um, probably upset a few purists, fitted a nice LED in there that I can actually see. Right, what else have we done? Well, I found I can feed a cassette in. It's um needs a bit of help. I think it can eject okay, let me just try that. Um, can it? Ah oh, yes, this motor here gets a bit sticky. Yeah. Okay, so that's, you know, sort of working. But when it comes to closing it, what I have to do, it gets all stuck about there. Power it down, manually drive the deck in. Right, so the tape's going down now. When I've wound that fully down, power it up, it laces up. 
So that's quite good. So you think, oh good, we're um, ready to try playing. But that's where it falls over because it seems to have a problem with real drive. So if I press, well even press forward, let's try fast forward. No. We'll rewind. Not really. We'll play. It spills a bit of tape out and stops. No. Something wrong with a real drive. You see, there's a tiny, tiny bit of real drive, but hardly any. Uh, it sounds like the motors are spinning, but probably there's got um, worn out clutches. Now, you'd say, okay, take it apart and fix it. Well, there's two reasons I'm not doing that. One is that when I undid the screws from this deck and pulled it out, I could only pull it up a few centimetres and then it jams up on all the cables and they're plugged in in a myriad, myriad of different ways underneath here. It's extremely hard to gain access to the deck and I figured I was going to break something. And anyway, the plan is I wanted to go electrical to electrical. That's to say, I want the SDIF2 signal in and SPDIF signal out at the back here. Let's just show you So this is this SDIF2 signal in here and I want SPDIF out here and I don't want to run off the tape at all. So for the time being, I'm not worrying about the tape deck. All I want to do is signal processing. Now, for some reason, I can't get this to go into record pause. And I think it needs to go into record pause in order to route the signals. And I can understand that maybe in the digital selection here because there is no valid digital input at the moment. But with analog, I would have expected something to happen there. So I don't know what the problem is. It's just ignoring me, even though it has tape in there. And let me tell you one other blind alley I went up was looking at these connectors at the back here. I saw this connection. You can fight your way through all this rubbish. There's a big multi-way cable here, but there's also a BNC connector between the two halves. And I thought, ah, I better know what's going on here. That is SPDIF out from the interface box at the bottom feeding SPDIF in here when this has a digital source. And I was convinced of that, and I wasted some time looking for signals here. That was futile, because it turns out that that signal actually goes the other way, from here to here. I think it's a clocking signal, not sure. So, no point looking for SPDIF there. If I'm going to get SPDIF anywhere, it's either going to be from here or somewhere internally. Looking at the front here, there's a big worry. Look. This says digital I.O. and it's selected to SPDIF2, which is what I want. But that's input and output. So that implies that I can't input SDIF2 and output the Philips Sony standard interface that we normally use. That's worrying. It could be that it won't go in and out. It may can only, only do one or the other, in which case it just doesn't do my job. Oh well, let's see what happens. There's one more thing I wanted to show you. Switch that off. So this is a DTS 1000ES, this one. So it's an extremely similar machine, but it's self-contained. It doesn't have this external thing. It can't do this FDIF signal we need. It... Um, has at the back fairly conventional inputs and outputs so this one's got digital in digital out and analog in and out and that's all I don't know if you can see that and it was because of this digital in here that I was thinking that that socket there was going to be digital in from here but that's not the case not that I've looked at the service manual this therefore is not really going to help me at all Right, I think the next thing to do is we want to go and have a look at what a standard SPDIF Philips Sony signal looks like on an oscilloscope. I'll just play some digital audio out 
from a DAT machine into an oscilloscope. And then we can go and search for that signal when this is all hooked up to the PCM1630. Right. OK, here's what uh, I found. I've just connected the SPDIF output from a DAT player uh, to this input. And it's, you know, it's a fairly random data stream. It doesn't look like there's anything I can really um, trigger on terribly easily. Let's go single sweep and have a look. Yeah, OK, so if I see a data stream like that, uh, and what's the level? Looks to be around about 1 volt peak to peak plus a bit of overshoot. If I can find a data stream like that uh, inside the DAT machine or the interface unit, then there's a fighting chance that that might be the SPDIF signal. Right, we're set up here with PCM1630 feeding into this machine. I don't know if I've got the correct outputs on the back of the PCM30. There are two possibilities, so I'll have to try it with both. But first, let's see if when I play a tape on the 1630, I get a signal of some sort on that input. Being a little careful because this is connected to raw mains, and normally I work on isolated supplies. So, let's uh, start a tape, make sure there's something playing. You can't see that, unfortunately. I might have to run it out of sight. Right, there's something playing. Let's see if I can detect that on the SDIF2 inputs, which is this old Sony format. Quite close to power supply, so being careful. OK, there's something there. Auto set. Cheat. Right. So that's what's coming off the machine. That looks like a real signal. Let's look at the other channel. There's two SDIF2 signal to, takes two channels. Right. That looks believable. Let's um, put this oscilloscope over the power supply, which is a scary area. Now, we're looking at these um, ICs here, these big ones. CX23070. There's no information to speak of online for that. But uh, it goes via some gates to an output here that wanders off back out to the DAT machine. And I'm hoping that's a digital SPDIF signal. So I want to look at that on this uh, IC509, which is in there somewhere, uh, output pin 12. And we're looking for some digital data that looks similar to what we saw when we uh, scoped uh, the SPDIF signal, which is our normal digital audio signal these days. So pin 12 of IC509. It doesn't look the same though, does it? I don't know what you think. I don't think that looks like the same kind of signal as we were getting on uh, an S SPDIF. That doesn't look right. However, the tape is uh, finished and that audio seems to have stopped. That digital data stopped. Well, there's something there. Is it worth feeding that into the input of a digital audio recorder? I think it might be worth a try, mightn't it? But, what's the problem here? We've got two volts per division, two and a half divisions, yes, five volt peak to peak as you'd expect uh, from a 7.4 series IC. And the SPDIF input signal is about half a volt. So uh, I need to um, put in a little attenuator or I'll blow up my uh, digital recorder. Maybe it's just struggling to trigger on it. I don't think that's valid, but come on, let's plug it into the audio connect, audio uh, recorder and see what we get. So with no signal at all connected, I just get, if I hit record, DIN unlock. Right. Now let's connect this signal. Moment of truth. DIN unlock. Do you know? <laughs> I was expecting that. 
is not a valid signal. It's still not right. So our problem would appear to be that the internal signal that goes from the B unit to the A unit and takes the digital audio does not comply to the SPDIF standard. And I suppose there's no reason for it to have to. That's definitely a valid signal because if I hit stop, let me just play the signal there, let me get it stable, and now hit stop, it goes. So it's definitely digital audio signal, but it's not the standard we're looking for. So I'm presently scoping the signal from this um, output of that IC, which I believe is the signal that goes to the DAP machine. Uh, and at the moment there's a quiet section on the tape, let's rewind or get it onto a section where there's some audio. It kind of, you know, it looks like there's something there, but it's not the same as the SPDIF signal, is it? I don't think so. If I fiddle with this, the DIO input set to SDIF2, and if I change it, it's a bit logical to me because it's the SDIF input we want, but if I change it, we get something that looks possibly more like the SPDIF signal here. So it's worth sticking that on the uh, digital recorder, isn't it, and see what we get. Didn't unlock. Mm. And let me just check the uh, amplitude of that signal. Yeah, that looks right. The noise you've got fingers on it, but that's the sort of thing. But whichever the, uh, whatever the setting of the switch on the front of the um, interface unit, I can't get. The digital audio recorder to do anything apart from say dinner and lock. Yeah, it could be an issue with my attenuator. I've got a, something like a 9k and a 1k resistor as divided by 10 attenuator. Maybe that's not valid. But unless the input impedance of this is very low, that seems about right. Now we get the real signal when this is set to SDIF2, which is what I expect. When that switch is set to SDIF2, because that's when we get a signal during play and not during stop. But the protocol for that signal is a mystery and it would appear not to be the one we're looking for. There must be some further digital processing going on inside the uh, DAP machine. Except it's not working. And let me try one more time connecting the DAP machine, the digital audio recorder, directly to the um, DAP machine's digital output socket. Okay, let's, uh, let's play on the uh, pneumatic, record on this, did unlock. And there seems to be nothing I can do. Oh! Where's that awful noise coming from? Oh, relay's clattering. I've put this into record. We're getting we're getting something. I've put the DAP machine into a cord which never worked before and the VU meter is bouncing but I've got relays clicking on and off here as that emphasis lights bouncing on and off let me hit stop on the tape deck right oh wow we're getting a bit closer so the emphasis is on and off, on and off.
set the sampling for use in 44, which of course this tape is, and I've got VU meters operating properly now. Let's press record on this. Still says DIN unlock. Oh, we've got so much closer now. This record never worked before. I don't know why it started working now. So, this is receiving that signal. If I put a pair of headphones on here, I dare say we'll be able to hear the music. Try that. Yes. Wow. That's a whole heap of progress. But can I now take this digital output from the back of this DAP machine and feed it into my digital audio recorder? Well, it seems not. Because this switch here is digital input and output. So when that's selected to SDIF2, it disables the signal I need, the output, which is the uh, SPDIF output. So it won't work in what's called E to E mode. I need to get this machine recording and then play the tape back, which is terrible. But still, I can't use this signal here. So that's not the right protocol. So it seems such a shame having made so much progress I can now feed this wacky SDIF2 input into this machine and it will see it and recognize it but it's just not built and designed to be able to output the standard modern SPDIF digital audio output uh, which I can send to a digital audio recorder. Just the wrong kit for the job. What a shame. Well, that didn't really work out, did it? And it's not just because this thing needs the deck servicing. And, you know, maybe I'll fix that later. But it's not a good solution anyway, really, to have to go from the PCM1630 Umatic tape onto DAT and then copy from DAT digitally. It would give you a pure digital route, but going via another tape is non-ideal, especially with such an old mechanism. It's not going to give great results. So what Sony sold back in the day was a sample rate converter model DFX 2400. And that would take SDIF2 in and give you a modern digital format out, a SEBU, which is mm, kind of interchangeable with um, SD, uh, SPDIF. Other solutions, there was a manufacturer, Apogee, Apogee, uh, Apogee. Their UV1000 CD encoder would also do the same function. Uh, but they stopped making them back in 1996. And I actually contacted them, very, very helpful. But uh, it's a case of trying to get hold of one on a second-hand market somewhere. Another solution, of course, would have been what originally was an option for the PCM1630, which was a card DABK1631, which you could install in it and would give you uh, a SEBU digital output. But that disabled the analog output, or one of the analog outputs. So that really isn't a great solution. And anyway, try to get hold of one, <laughs> some chance. So... If you happen to have any of those or any other, because there were other devices, uh, any other solution that would uh, allow me to go from this SDIF2 signal to a modern uh, SPDIF or ASEBU or TOSLINK connection, please let me know. I'd be very interested. In the meantime, please remember to like, share and especially subscribe, and I'll do a lot more content on audio and video technology in the near future. Bye for now.